Hi, I'm Miss Tyler, and welcome to another episode of Context for Kids, where I teach you guys stuff most adults don't even know. If this is your first time hearing, or if you've missed anything, you can find all the episodes archived at contextforkids.podbean.com, which has them downloadable, or at contextforkids.com, where I have transcripts for readers, or on my Context for Kids YouTube channel. Parents, all scripture this week comes from the MTV, the Miss Tyler version, which is the Christian Standard Bible modified a bit to make it easier for kids to understand the content and the context. So everyone's talking about something amazing going on at a Christian university in Kentucky called Asbury. Now, there are two different schools in that town. One is a theological seminary where people study to become ministers. But the school I'm talking about is just a four-minute walk down the road. On Wednesday morning, all the students at the university were gathered for chapel to hear a message from God's Word. These kids seriously love God. And by kids, I mean that most of them are under 25 years old. And to me, that's kids even though they sound like old people to you. They're definitely grown-ups, but... They're also kids compared to me because when I was their age, they weren't even born yet. But I'm going to tell you something important. God doesn't care how old you are when he wants to do something amazing in your life or when he wants to use you to do something for him. Anyway, like I was saying, they were all gathered for chapel. So if you don't like going to church four times a week, then this is not the school for you. I'd love it. And the leader for that day gave a sermon from Romans on the sins that keep us from truly loving each other. I thought it was a really good sermon and that he did a great job. It wasn't a flashy sermon and he seems like just a normal person like you and me. But then after the sermon, the choir sang their songs and after they stopped, people just kept on singing and singing and and never stopped. And they're still singing even now. And it's like, what, 13 days later, they had to fill extra buildings. And there are people lined up all over the place wanting to join in worshiping God. And the people in line are worshiping God. And people have flown in from all over North America and from all over the world to come and see what is going on. I haven't been there, but I do know two people who have been there the entire time. One teaches French at the university, and the other teaches New Testament at the theological seminary down the road. They are husband and wife, and he comes from America, and she comes from the Republic of the Congo, where she escaped as a war refugee, and the story of how they came to be married is a really great one. We know from the Bible that worship is very important to God, and we are supposed to be worshiping him all the time with the things we do and the choices we make and even how we treat our bodies and especially in how we treat each other. In Bible times, everything was religious. Going to the market to buy food was religious. Farming was religious, which means that everything in their lives was about God or about the gods, depending on, you know, who they were and how they believed. In ancient Israel, they saw God as part of absolutely everything they did, from sleeping to eating to what they wore and what stories they told. Just everything was about God and his relationship with them. They believed that God was involved in every part of their lives, and the people who didn't, they were called wicked and foolish because they actually thought they could hide things from God, and he wouldn't see what they were doing And so they could be really hurtful to others and think they would get away with it. But God does see us and sees everything and knows everything. You know, it's actually nice that he knows everything because we can be absolutely honest with him and nothing we say can surprise him. Like, okay, we could say, Lord, I was being a real jerk to my baby sister yesterday. And he's never going to say, what? I can't believe you did that. I never would have guessed. Nope. But he might say something like, oh yeah, I noticed. You need to go make it up to her and make things right again and then come back to me and we're going to talk about it. 
Now, I have to share with you why I believe God chose young people and not older people like me. These people are at the beginning of their grown-up lives, and they love God so much that they go to a college where they are surrounded by people who also love Him and who worship together at least every other day. Do you think that makes God happy? That young people are doing this on purpose instead of going to a school with a lot of parties and drugs and really bad stuff going on? This school doesn't allow any of that. And they kick out people who behave that way. They send them back home so they can go to the kind of school that lets their students do absolutely anything they want to do. Like the school I went to. And some messed up stuff happened to people I know, and especially the girls. But when I was the age of these young people, I didn't love God. I knew he was there, and sometimes he would talk to me, but I really just didn't like him very much. I didn't trust him, and I was very angry at him. And he didn't hate me because of that. He knew why I felt that way, and he did a lot of work to change me enough that I could love him and not be so sad and angry all the time. If the me from today went back to college, I would definitely want to be in a place where I would go to church four times a week. Now, a lot of older people like me are just stubborn and set in their ways and very judgmental. They don't like it when something's happening to anyone who isn't exactly the same as they are. They think that if people don't believe this or that, then God doesn't want to use them or bless them like this. Others believe that God shouldn't do something like this with young people at all and that it should be older people who have been Christians longer. But God doesn't care what we think and who we think deserves to be part of something like this. In fact, none of us can say we deserve something so wonderful because that's very prideful and we're not supposed to be like that. We aren't supposed to be bragging or even thinking that we are all that in a bag of chips or that we have everything figured out so that God should use us instead of someone else. God told his disciples that everyone who exalts themselves would be humbled and everyone who humbles themselves will be exalted. But what does that mean? That means that people who brag and think that they're really awesome will be sorry because they're going to be very embarrassed. And that God will make the people who are quiet about themselves very great in the kingdom. Next week, we're going to look at the book of Esther and how Esther was very humble, but the evil Haman was very prideful and exalted himself. She ended up queen and he ended up dead after being really embarrassed in front of everyone in a huge city. And some people are calling what's happening in Kentucky a revival, and others are calling it an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I want you guys to understand what those words mean so you can understand what people are talking about. First of all, the word revival is not a Bible word. It's a word that people have made up to describe when certain things happen. Now we do see words like revive in the Bible a lot. And dang, there is this one spot in where God is talking to Ezekiel, the prophet, and something totally freaky happens. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. Now, can you even imagine God picking you up and putting you down in a valley full of bones? He led me all around those bones. There were so many of them laying right on the ground of the valley, and the bones were very dry. Then God said to me, Son of man, which means human being, it's kind of God's pet name for Ezekiel. <laughs> he said, Son of man, can these bones live? I replied, Lord God, only you know, which means I don't know, I have no clue, and I don't even want to try to guess. God said to me, prophesy about these bones and say to them, dry bones, you pay attention to the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will make it so you are breathing again and you will be alive. I will put tendons on you, make muscles grow on you and cover you with skin. I will make you breathe again so that you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I told the bones everything I'd been commanded to say. 
while I was talking to the bones about God and his promises, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. As I looked, tendons appeared to hold them together. Muscles grew and skin covered them, but they still weren't breathing. God said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says, breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these dead people so they will be alive again. So I told the bones what God told me. The breath entered them and they came to life and they stood on their feet. They were a huge army. Wow. And that's Ezekiel 37 verses 1 through 10 if you want to look it up yourself. Dang, I bet you didn't think there was anything like that in the Bible. But God did that to show Ezekiel that he was going to bring his people to life again. You see, they'd been conquered and were living in a foreign country where everyone around them was an idol worshiper. The people wondered if their lives as Jews were over and if they would ever be able to go back to Jerusalem or be at the temple ever again. It was a sad and scary time to be alive, and they didn't know if things would ever change. But God was showing Ezekiel that not only can he make a huge pile of dead bones into a living group of humans again, he could also bring all of his people back home again and make them a country again and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. But this is where we get the idea of revival, that word I promised to explain to you. Revival can mean when... Someone or something is asleep or very sick or dead when they wake up, get better, or come back to life. In church life, we call something a revival when God does something amazing to the people who worship him. One day everything's normal and then boom, out of nowhere, it's like God has breathed into them like he did with those bones. And they become more alive than they were before. In the Bible, and especially in the book of Acts, which tells the story of the apostles traveling around preaching about Jesus, this is called an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is what happened 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, when he came out of the tomb that they had laid him in after he died on the cross. Three days later, he was revived not dead anymore, but alive and more alive than he'd ever been before. On Pentecost that year, all of Jesus' followers, 120 of them, were gathered together and were worshiping God, and they did that because Jesus told them to stay there and do that. All of a sudden, they heard a huge noise, and the Holy Spirit entered the place they were in and filled them up inside, and they even had flames on their heads. And they started speaking strange languages that none of them knew. And they were all telling people about God. And the people visiting Jerusalem from all over the Roman and Scythian empires were just shocked that they were hearing about God in their own language from back home. And they were so amazed that 3,000 people became believers in Jesus that day. And they took the message of Jesus back to their homes after the festival. Now, that's definitely what I call a revival. These people were all Jewish, and they all accepted Jesus as their king. And when that happened, they were filled with God's spirit too, just like all those dead bones. Without Jesus, we are a lot like those dead bones that Ezekiel talked to about God's promises. Some parts of us are just as dead as those dried out bones, but God revives us gives us life with his Holy Spirit so that we can be his people. Now, what happened in Acts 2 was just huge, and it affected a lot of people all at once, and there were also miracles, so that it is called an outpouring of the Spirit, because God took his Spirit and poured it into everyone who believed Jesus. Just remember that to be revived is to change someone from being dead or almost dead to being filled with life. And an outpouring of the Spirit is just a pouring out of the Spirit into people. But there are also times in the Bible where God makes it so that everyone around can feel that he is there really strongly. And that's an amazing feeling. 
For me, it's like I can feel every little cell in my body. I feel like a bottle of fizzy soda. And I know he's right there with me. I feel it most often when I'm really sick. And that's really nice. It's like a hug from God, and I know he's helping me to get better. But what about when God does that with an entire place? That's kind of what happened at Asbury University. It started with a few people continuing to sing after the choir ended their song, and then it spread and spread, and people could feel that God was right there with them, enjoying their company and the songs they were singing to them. You know, he has special angels who do nothing but sing to him. That's what they were created for. But when we worship him, when we can't even see him, that's extra special. Humans choose to love God and to worship him and to obey him and to serve him and to trust him. We also choose to do some really messed up stuff. But when we all come together and when we don't care which church we go to or what we look like or what language we speak or how much money anyone has, or where we all come from, then it's an amazing thing. It's what God wants. And at the very end of the Bible, that's what God's city looks like. People of all kinds, all shapes and sizes and colors and languages all gathered together, loving each other and loving God. We will all sing, so happy to just be together like we were always supposed to be, Worshiping God together the way we were created to do. When people do that here and now, it looks a lot like the kingdom of Jesus will when he rules over all of us as king. No wonder God would want to come down in a special way to be part of it. And the people I know who are there tell me that the ministers of all the churches around town are talking to the crowds in line, and people who didn't used to believe it that Jesus was even real are believing in him. Sick people are being healed and miracles are happening. The professors at the schools are praying with the people who want prayer, but no one gets up in front of the people to talk unless they're a student. God visited young people who were doing this, and the adults decided that they needed to just let them keep doing it because God seems to be really happy about it. Isn't that cool? A lot of times, adults really mess up a good thing by stepping in and trying to take control over it. They decide to do it a better way, and everything falls apart. And so all these grown-ups decided to let God do what he wants to do for as long as he wants to do it. Big-time preachers and singers have asked if they can come and preach and sing in front of the church, and the university people said, no. No one's getting famous here. No one can even see who's up in front of everyone singing or reading Bible verses. No one is allowed to do anything except worship God and Jesus. Everyone's praying and singing. No one there is better than anyone else. Only Jesus is better than anyone else. Only Jesus is perfect. Only Jesus deserves all the attention. Just like at the book of Acts, when all those Jews who believed Jesus went back to their countries and preached about Jesus... The same thing is happening with the students who have been visiting Asbury. They're going back to their schools, and the same thing is happening there too. You can think of it like the churches and the schools are catching on fire because they got close to someone who came back. Or like a virus that everyone needs to catch. But just like in the Bible, not everyone is happy about it. In the Bible, although everyone who believed in Jesus at that point was Jewish... All the enemies of Jesus were Jewish too, and they didn't like what was happening. Even before Jesus died, some of them were saying, all the world is going to him. And they weren't happy about that because it meant that Jesus was becoming more popular and important than they were. There were so many Pharisees and scribes and priests and normal everyday Jews who started believing Jesus, but there were also very powerful people who didn't and especially the chief priest and the high priest, Caiaphas. And they'd been spreading rumors and telling lies even before Jesus died because they were jealous of all the attention that Jesus was getting and because of all the miracles he could do when they couldn't do any. You know, it would have been okay if they were concerned about what was going on and they were asking questions like Nicodemus did, but they hated what was happening and they were trying to make it stop. Jealousy is a terrible thing. It can turn even nice people into monsters, and the Sadducees, who were the head honchos of the temple, weren't nice people to begin with. 
They were greedy, liars, cruel, and corrupt, which means they weren't doing their jobs honestly. And if the high priest was supposed to be anything, it would certainly be honest in serving God and the people, right? But all they could see was that Jesus was stealing the honor they thought belonged to themselves. They thought, even with what low-down, dirty skunks they were, and we know all about that because all the Jewish writers who wrote about them just hated how awful they were. Well, they thought they deserved to be respected and admired by all the other Jews. They thought they were the best, and that what they believed was best, and how they did things was best, and more than that, they figured that being rich and powerful was just proof that they deserved it, and that God loved them more than anyone else. How come it's always those types of people who think that the awful things they do are okay to God? So, they were lying about Jesus before he died and, again, after he rose from the dead. And today, the exact same thing happens, even with Christians. It wasn't long after the kids at Asbury began worshiping God all day, every day, that some religious leaders started spreading nasty rumors about the student leaders. Rumors that have proven to be false, but lies spread faster than the truth. But the people I know who are there are very trustworthy and good people. You know, they've even helped me with this radio show. They have said that none of the bad rumors are true and that the people saying those things haven't even bothered to come and see for themselves. I've been playing their worship on YouTube all day and there's nothing fancy going on and there's nothing crazy going on. God is just being worshipped and the people are being blessed. Some grown-ups are saying, unless these people do this or that the same way I do, then this isn't a real revival. Or another person said, those women aren't wearing any skirts, so God is definitely not part of this. And how about, they let women teach there and God hates that. Seems like a lot of people think that their churches are the only ones that have everything right and that God should have chosen them for this. But God chooses who he chooses and doesn't have to tell us why. I'm going to be really honest. I think that God would rather do something like this with people whom everyone else thinks doesn't deserve it because they will accept it as a gift that they don't deserve. Grown-ups, when something like this happens to us, we tend to decide that it happened because God wants everyone to be like us and he's putting this great big stamp of approval on us. And that's the worst attitude in the world, but I've heard it from a lot of grown-ups. Of course, they don't think that's what they're saying, but everyone who's listening to them knows the truth. It isn't God's job to make everyone like us. He wants everyone to be like him, and to do that, we have to be like Jesus. We have to do things like forgiving the people who've hurt us, even when we have to stay far away from them because they're not safe, and not taking revenge or getting even when somebody hurts us. Even when we do have to call the police sometimes when people are really dangerous, but we're supposed to try and treat other people like they are better than we are, not like we're better than everyone else. But when grown-ups say things like, they aren't the right sort of people, what they're really saying is, that should have happened to people like me instead. When they say, God wouldn't do anything that way, they're telling God what he can and cannot do. When they make up lies and are quick to believe gossip and rumors, they are showing that they have evil thoughts and envy and jealousy in their hearts toward anyone whom God wants to use and bless. We need to have a different attitude. When something amazing happens and God is being praised and praised and praised and people are coming to know Jesus and miracles are happening, we just need to be glad it happened. It doesn't matter who it happens to, only that it's happening and that God and people are being blessed and lives are being changed. We still don't know all of what's going to happen, but deciding that something is bad right away can get us into a lot of trouble with God. I'm sure that you've heard of the young man named Saul, who was later called Paul, who went out arresting and hurting the Jews who were following Jesus. He decided that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah and that his followers were criminals and that God would never use Jesus or them for anything. But then, on his way to the great city of Damascus to arrest Jesus' followers there, he suddenly became blind, and he heard a voice from heaven. That voice belonged to Jesus, and Jesus said that when you hurt his followers, you are hurting him. So we need to be careful. I love you. I'm praying for you. Next week, we're going to talk about Queen Esther. <laughs>